I'm sure would be incredibly familiar in an area like this. And when I say an area, I mean a region of our country, just for the things that are noted here. I heard this phrase, I heard about face. I was reminded of Haggai, where when Haggai opens the instruction from the prophet to a people is that you have been busy with so many other things. Your attention has been given over. You have put priority on your own homes and this and that. And Haggai begins to detail the instruction that he is sensing in the moment from the Lord that he is relaying to a people in a specific region. He is bringing spiritual insight by way of what has been revealed to him. And you can sum it up in these words, about face. Says it's time for you to get, we sang it, it's time for you to get face to face with me because there are things that I desire to say to you for the things that I am looking to do on the ground in a city amongst the people for the sake of this great land. We are incredibly humbled and privileged to be able to be here for these next couple of days. And I wanted to start things off a specific way to kind of frame in what it is that we are going to be about over these next days. You see, I understand that in our day we are over-programmed and event-oriented and we are so familiar with loading our calendar with things to do. Even in a Christian context, you do not lack at large if you want another event to attend. And so, in fact, when the Lord spoke to our team and invited us to begin hosting what we know as conferences, to be, to be honest, I, I wasn't necessarily thoroughly excited at the invitation. Because I said, Lord, I'm not looking to just join the event cycle. I'm not looking to just be a part of the conference orientation for the sake of being able to say that we pulled another one off. I have zero interest in coming and just doing church or hosting cute gatherings or doing something that would pique your interest for entertainment value. That's nowhere on my radar. And I said, Lord, if you don't don't reveal to us what it is that we are supposed to be doing, what is our contribution? We feel like we have been invited to go city by city and through prayer and through dreams and through visions, the Lord started revealing, highlighting literally on a map, certain cities began to glow. I said, Lord, if this is the way you're leading us, then what is it that we are to do? I'm I'm honestly not looking to host a conference. I frequent them. I'm not against them. This is not a knock towards all of what others may be trying to do. I'm just telling you where I was in my own heart. And the Lord said, you say conference, I say convocation. And I honestly had to look up the definition for the term, though I've heard it many times in many different places. And a convocation is a holy assembly in response to a summons. It's the language of Joel chapter 1 when Joel is surveying the land and he recognizes that darkness is abounding, that sin is increasing, that compromise is being celebrated, that there is barrenness and there is drought and even the fields are crying out for lack of rain and all of the dryness that they are experiencing and Joel is surveying the land in chapter 1 and when you open in chapter 2, Joel begins to declare... Sound the trumpet. Gather the people. It's time to call for a holy assembly. He says, consecrate men and women and children. Let there be fasting. Let there be weeping. Let there be crying out to God on behalf of the land. So this is why we have gathered. Because we believe that it is time in this region of our nation to begin crying out to God on behalf of the land. Now that may sound something familiar to you, but in many cases and in many instances, the experience at large is not one that is filled with recognition and desperation. 
in many instances, you can go and experience church and never necessarily experience God. Churches have become entertainment. They've become informative. Well, I can tell you over these days, we have not come to have a TED Talk about Jesus. We need the power of God. We need the presence of the Holy Ghost. Because unless God moves, we can take all of the church mechanics, systems, planning, orientation, all of your rhythmic cycle that you may be familiar with, and put it to the side. I'm glad worship went an hour and 10 minutes because I'm sure some of us were incredibly uncomfortable. But if we believe that God is looking to cater to our preferences, we are already in trouble. We are already in a place where our heart has become desensitized to what a real move of God would be. Sometimes we need to move so God can move the way that he desires to. So we've come to gather in a holy way. We've come to pray, to fast, to declare the word of the Lord, to cry out on behalf of the land. Listen, I'm speaking right now to intercessors that are in the house, to prophets who have an ear to hear. God is on the verge and your city plays a strategic role in what is about to unfold in this nation, in our generation. We have to reorient our lives back to Jesus. Notice I said back to Jesus. We have to once again become fixed and fixated and obsessed with the person of Jesus. Church is about Jesus. Conferences are about Jesus. Worship is about Jesus. Your Bible is about Jesus. Prayer is about Jesus. Fasting is about Jesus. It is all from him, for him, and back to him. He is everything, but just because he is everything theologically, does not necessarily mean that he has become everything to me experientially. You see, some of us have adopted language. We learn a new language. We can say all of the catchphrases. We know all the new quotes. We can even quote scriptures. I'm not asking you if you've adopted a new language. But I'm asking you, has Jesus given access to permeate all of your lifestyle? He's wanting to get into his people and just not onto our lips. He said of the Pharisees, you praise me with your lips, but your hearts, your hearts are so far from me. You know what to say, you know what to sing, and you know even like Job's friends, you can quote all the scriptures at the people that are going through problematic scenarios. You can offer all the Christian sounding counsel. You know all of what is coming out of your mouth, but has what is coming out of your mouth gotten so deep down into your heart that it has actually affected the whole of who you are as a person? Where my life has been reoriented, not just so that I can become accommodating to a church schedule in my lifestyle, but to where I get reoriented to the person of Jesus, where he becomes everything to me. We are his people. To be obsessed with him, he is to be our greatest fascination, our ultimate obsession, the one that has so raptured our hearts and our lives. It is all about Jesus. And so over these days, we're going to talk a lot about Jesus. If you have a Bible, you can open it to John chapter 14.
had a dream years ago that has directly influenced and initiated all of what we are now doing all across the nation and even North America as it has been already um, described. You see, I, I want you to understand tonight that without the real power of the Holy Spirit, we are not in a fair fight. That without the real empowerment of God's Spirit, we have no shot in what it is that we are up against. You see, the enemy is not afraid of all of the externals, of all of the imagery, of all of the facades, of all of the masks, of all of the games that we have learned over time how to play so that we can hide what's really real so that we can give people what it is that they want to see. If social media has done anything, it has magnified what has already been in the heart of man. It has just magnified it. It has brought it up into a much larger platform and given visibility to what has already been buried deeply within the nature of men and women creation on the ground. And that is the imagery that we put out wanting likes and wanting subscribers and wanting followers with a reality that's not real but it's social because it creates an idea, a resume, a perception of what I want people to think I am while being able to hide behind a keyboard or a touchpad with the things that I'm actually going through. But tonight God wants to dig into who I actually am. He wants to change who it is that I actually am. Not just in my own spirituality that I know how to keep alive by the effort of my own fleshly behaviors, but who I really am on a default ground zero fundamental level. Me and Jesus. Who I am. The struggles I currently carry. The problems that seem uh, like a cycle in my life. Revolving doors of scenarios and sin cycles and temptations and brokenness. The attention that so many times gets put on other things that people applaud externally. You see, many of us know how to keep our gifting going, but in keeping our gifting going, it is just a shield for people to create attentiveness on my gifting so they don't dig deeper than what I'm wielding. <laughs> so they never actually get to me because all they're looking is at the way that God may use me or things that may come through me. And so the attention becomes on what to do rather than on what I actually am. But tonight, God is looking beyond your gift. Tonight, God is looking beyond the know-hows. And he's looking to what it is that we actually are. Because it is his goal, the Bible says, to conform us to the image of his son. A people on the ground that look like Jesus. A people on the ground that don't just know how to do what Jesus did. Right? We can learn Jesus' behaviors and not be like Jesus. But to where we are literally transfigured, to where we are transformed, to where we are becoming by way of nature what he actually is. This is Matthew 5, 6, and 7. He opens himself up. These are the be attitudes. It's what we should be in our attitudes as we are following Jesus. He opens himself up and he says, this is what I am like. And when I get in you, you will no longer have to try to fake it till you make it, but I will be myself. And I will over time begin to effortlessly come out of you as you give yourself to me in a yielded way. As we yield to him, he takes up residency inside of us. And him being himself 
He begins to literally permeate everything about who we are. And as we abide in him, the Bible tells us that the fruit of the spirit will actually begin to become what the makeup of our lives actually are. Not that we are trying to make fruit, but that fruit will actually just begin to be what our lives are about as we are about Jesus. I had a dream several years ago, and in this dream, for those of you that dream, I came into the dream, and I was standing in what was a massive parking lot, and I was on the edge of this parking lot that was run up against an enormous field, and as I began to look around, the field was so vast it seemed to go on for as far as the eye could see. And I began to look to my right and to my left, and the parking lot was filled with individuals. I knew that. There were a lot of individuals that were there, and everyone seemed to be doing the same thing. There was a great sense of anticipation that had erupted from the parking lot. I could sense it while I was standing there in the dream, and I was aware that everyone was awaiting something. Something was about to go down, and I was trying to figure out what it was that I was doing there as I was looking around. And my attention turned back to the field, And out in the distance, there was a figure that appeared. And I could see that it was darkened. And as it began to get closer, it seemed to be coming in our direction as I was standing at the edge of the parking lot up against the field. And as it drew closer, I noticed that it was actually off of the ground. It seemed to be hovering. And it was dressed from head to toe in all black. And there seemed to be some sort of hood. There was a robe, but there seemed to be some sort of hood that it was wearing. And its face was all glossy and smoked out. And I couldn't necessarily tell male or female. But in the moment, I didn't really care. That wasn't what was on my attention. It was just that this being that was levitating or hovering off of the ground was coming our way. And I actually got gripped with a little bit of fear trying to figure out why nobody else was doing anything or if they were even seeing what it was that I was seeing. I stood there, the being drew closer, and as it was about 100 yards out and coming closer, I knew in the dream that I was looking at what was a grand wizard. I didn't even know what that was. I had to get up and Google that when I woke up. And then I was a little bothered by what I found out. You see, a grand wizard is a regional authority in the ranks of the KKK. (laughs) And I knew that in the dream I was looking at what was a grand wizard. And it kept coming closer and closer. And as it got close enough to where we could see and hear what was actually happening, the grand wizard that was levitating off of the ground, glossed out and smoky in nature, I knew that I was being confronted by what was a principality. And it was chanting in this demonic tongue and circling round about out in the field. And as the chanting grew more aggressive in nature and louder in sound, there was all of a sudden a shift in the atmosphere. And there was lightning and thunder and darkness and clouds. And the whole atmosphere began to change, seeming to respond to what the behavior of the wizard was doing. And I began to take steps backwards because I was going to run. And as I was backing up in the dream, I was looking to my right and my left, again, trying to figure out why no one else was going to run like I was going to run, and why no one seemed bothered by the events that were currently unfolding. And as I was doing so, there was a large space that became open in the crowd. Everyone seemed to move to each side, making room for a luxurious vehicle that was approaching. And this luxurious vehicle, hundreds of thousands of dollars in value, everyone moved and made room for this car as the car pulled up, seeming to arrive on the scene. And the crowd erupted in some sort of celebration, almost as if this is what they were anticipating. 
And as they made room for the vehicle, there was a driver in the front and whomever was sitting in the back, the door opened and a man of great physical stature got out of the back seat. In the dream, I knew him and to be the bodybuilder, a large dark skinned gentleman who was dressed from head to toe in fantastic, really exquisite apparel. Um, as they would have said, dressed to the nines. And the crowd began to applaud. And this man began to almost flex and stretch, getting ready, knowing in response to the crowd that he seemed to be what the people were waiting for. Fancy vehicle. He had the look, he had the applause, massive in built, the bodybuilder, even the name is funny. And he began walking out into the field. I knew that he was going to confront the wizard. And the crowd was on the edge of the parking lot awaiting what was going to happen in this confrontation. And the man got out into the field, and they began circling one another. And again, the wizard chanting in this tongue, I knew that he was like increasing in demonic power and strength. And they were circling round about one another, and I thought to myself, man, if there's going to be a moment where I'm going to run, now's my chance, because everyone's attention is on what's going on. And I said, man, this is not going to be a physical fight. Like, I don't know what's about to go down, but this is definitely spiritual in nature. And as they began to circle round about one another, the bodybuilder looked into the presence of the wizard, and he shouted three times, Jesus Christ! Jesus Christ! Jesus Christ! The wizard didn't seem to be moved. The wizard didn't seem to be bothered. The wizard looked back into the face of the bodybuilder. He said, you think that's all it takes? He said, you think that's, that's all it takes? That's going to work? He said, what will you do about these weapons? Beauty, vanity, materialism, and narcissism. He said, what do you have against these? And the countenance of the bodybuilder was broken. And he hung his head low. And I could tell in the moment that he sensed defeat or was defeated. And I began to back up because now I really knew that this was my moment. I'm telling you, I'm not joking about these things at all. I, I, those of you that dream, you understand the, the, the rush and the emotion at times that's that's corresponding with dreams, and I began backing up even farther, and as I did, I turned to actually leave, and I felt a tug on my shirt, and as I turned around, there was a small um, black child that had run up to me, and he said, where are you going? And I said, man, I'm trying to get up out of here, like, like, man, I don't know what everybody else is doing, but man, like, I'm leaving. And I said, where are we? Like, first off, like, man, I don't even know where I am. Like, where are we? I said, can you tell me what county we're in? And he didn't seem to respond as quickly as I wanted him to. And I said, man, you know what? Never mind. I have my phone on me, and I had my cell phone in my right pocket, and I pulled it out of my pocket, and I opened up what looked like Google Maps, and I did a pin drop, and it blew up really big on the screen, and it said area code 6 Three, one. Area code 631 is Suffolk County in New York. It's actually the county where the founder of the Satanic Church established his work. Um, in the early 1900s, all the way up to the 40s and 50s, in that part of Long Island, in that population, one out of every seven people were affiliated with the KKK. I didn't know this at the time, but, and I looked back at the little boy, 
And I said, man, I, I'm, I'm really going to try and leave. And he said, you don't understand. We need you here. And I woke up. And like I said, I had no idea what a grand wizard was. I had to actually Google what a grand wizard was. And then when I found out what a grand wizard was, I was a little worried that I was now going to be watched and they were going to trace my IP address and they were going to find out what it was I was trying to find out about them. And you see, but there are a few things that became very real to me in the dream. And I understand the theological confrontation that it may apply or that may become real to you and to me, even as we consider that the name of Jesus was not enough, nor did it seem to impress the wizard. I understand very well the theological confrontation that it may suggest. In the dream, I was standing in a large parking lot, and there were a lot of individuals there. I knew in the dream that there were a lot of individuals there, which means that no one was there together. There was a lack of unity. No one was there together. Everyone was holding down their own little spot in the parking lot. They were doing their own thing. They were there in an individual sense, not linked together with any other person that was there in attendance with anticipation of what was about to happen. There was no real unity. You see, everyone knew that the wizard was there, but everyone was waiting for the next luxurious vehicle to roll up on the scene. You see, vehicles in dreams and visions represent ministries. The next luxurious ministry to roll up on the scene. For the next bodybuilder to hop out to the applause of the crowd, having made room for an individual to arrive. This man had the look. Man, if I bump into one more person that tells me they're associated with a certain look or a certain feel or a certain stream or a certain vibe or a certain personality that my church follows this guy or my church follows after this style. They were waiting for somebody to hop out of the car to put on another show. He jumped out and he had the look. He had the vibe. He had the feel. And he started flexing in response to the crowd, knowing that the crowd had made room for him. And he went out to confront the wizard. But he had the name of Jesus on his lips. But you see, what's interesting to me is that he had the name of Jesus on his lips, but he had the influence of the wizard in his life. The wizard said, what will you do about these weapons? It sounds like this to the sons of Sceva. Jesus we know. Paul we know. But who in the world are you? Like, what in the world are you doing? People can make room for you, but it's not the same thing as heaven authorizing you. People may applaud you, but it's not the same thing as heaven backing you. The sons of Sceva had Jesus on their lips that Paul preached. But they found out what happens when you approach demonic confrontation with a lack of authenticity in your life. The wizard was not moved because you cannot confront and evict demonic principalities nor displace demonic systems with just what's on your lips when you embrace them with what's going on in your life. He said, you want to remove me from this field, but you can't get rid of me in your heart. What will you do with these weapons? Beauty, vanity, materialism, and narcissism. You see, beauty can be defined as an overwhelming or a deep-seated sensual satisfaction. You see, beauty deals with the things we see, what we hear, what we touch, what we taste. It deals with the cravings of this natural man. It deals with how you satisfy your natural person. It deals with the things that we are drawn to, what we crave, what we desire, what we go after. Now, we all realize that these things are supposed to be all directly pointed at the person of Jesus. Because we were made to be satisfied by him and satisfaction in him breaks the hold of other lovers that we approach in our life when we are not fully wholly satisfied in him 
Anything that you go looking for outside of satisfaction in Jesus becomes a lesser lover and the hold of such things in many instances we are not even aware of. Beauty is not simply just a physical, natural, visible attraction, but it deals with how you satisfy, how you satisfy your heart, the things you go looking for. You see, beauty deals with addiction because addiction promises to satisfy. You see, beauty deals with the whole pornographic industry because the pornographic industry promises to satisfy. You see, beauty deals with food and the things that we are bound to by way of natural satisfaction that in many cases because of a fasted lifestyle we've not yet even been able to realize that we need loosed from certain bondages and desires and cravings that we constantly turn to it deals with our entertainment industry man don't tell me that churches struggle with money when stadiums are filled on weekends so that people can be entertained by athletes. Man, you pay a hundred bucks to go to a game, but you complain whenever the offering comes around? Man, you'll buy your favorite player's jersey and you'll represent him because of the idol that he's become in your life, but you won't sow into Jesus? Beauty deals with how we satisfy ourselves with bondages that can only be broken by a sweet embrace of the cross. Vanity is being conceited with one's own appearance, with one's abilities, and with one's accomplishments. It's an infatuation with self. It's devilish in nature. Isaiah 14 says of the enemy in his own voice that is actually described in Isaiah 14, I will make myself to be like the Most High, and I will exalt my throne above the God of the heavens. Being conceited with our own abilities, being overwhelmingly satisfied and conceited with our own talents, you see, in Ezekiel 28, in reference to the enemy, it says that he had become so infatuated with his own beauty, his own wisdom, his own splendor, that actually because of a self-infatuation led him to iniquity. And because he had become so consumed with himself, it turned him to sin. And that becoming so consumed with himself, turning him to sin, it was the fundamental thing that got him cast out of the Garden of Eden. The Lord says, for you were on the mountain of God. You were in Eden in the beginning. You were in the Garden of Eden. Every precious stone covered you. You were beautiful in all of your splendor, in all of the decadence of your wisdom. You were unlike any of the other creatures and the creation of things that I had made. You were almost so perfect in all of your ways, almost, keyword. But you became so infatuated with yourself. You became so desiring of your own self-exaltation. You see, many of us would be okay with God moving as long as he did it through my church. Man, I'm telling you, I, I, I get so tired and heartbroken of talking to leaders. Thank God you don't have leaders like this. I get so tired of talking to leaders that are like, if God's going to move, he has to do it our way. If God's going to shake our city, we want to be the ones at the forefront. And I understand that initially this sounds like an innocent request, but behind it all is a prideful, ambitious desire that has not been broken by satisfaction in Jesus for a self-exaltation that is devilish in nature. It's a self-exaltation. It's becoming so fixated on yourself. Paul would have said it this way. It's no longer I that live. For the I has been completely laid down. It's been totally abolished. I'm 
no longer in captivity, which real bondage is being in the pursuit of yourself. <laughs> real bondage is only having you as a central point of what everything in your life must point back to. This is real captivity that is impossible to be freed from without a real, true, authentic empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Because if the Holy Spirit does anything, it frees me from the lock of my eyes being only on me so that I can fix them upon Jesus. Paul said the eye has been totally laid down. It's no longer I that live, but now it is Christ in me. Richard Wormbrandt, in referencing this verse, Paul's writings, says it's not only the old eye. <laughs> you see, a lot of us are like, man, thank God that old guy is gone. Thank God that the old man has been laid to rest. Thank God that all of the old struggles, all of the old bondage, all of the old addictions, all of the old iniquity, all of the old problems, all of the old cycles, all of the old scenarios. I am so thankful that I am not what I used to be. Whoo! Praise God. I, that, that's real exciting. But Richard Wormbrand said it's not only the old I that Paul is referencing. It's also the new I. Because if we're not careful, we get so infatuated with our new selves, this new creation, what God has done in me, the recognition of God's presence and God's power and his gifting and the influence and the authority and the way that he uses me and how he's blessed me, that we, if we are not careful, we are unwilling to lay down in complete brokenness and surrender, not just the old I, but the new I also. He doesn't only want the old eye. He wants the new eye. You see, materialism can be defined, yes, I'm sure we're all aware, by a tangible investment in the material world around us. It's an anchor in this present world and the experience thereof by way of material possessions and the acquiring of financial stature, wealth, and gain. But it is also equally secondarily defined as a complete casting off of spiritual value, culture, and orientation. We understand that this world is not our home. We say that, but many of us are living like there is nothing else. Please understand the nature of the gatherings, too. This is not necessarily something that is directed at you, where you may be seated. It is over a city and over a region. However, if the shoe fits, then possibly. <laughs> this world is not our home. Our investment is in the age to come. Our investment, the writer of Hebrews says, for those of us who have become partakers of the precious Holy Ghost, the gift of God. He says, and we have become partakers and we've been given a taste of the powers of the age to come by way of God's spirit that has actually now come inside of me to free me from the desire to lay down an anchor in anything that right now, though it may seem immediate and urgent, is simply just temporary because it eventually will expire when this age comes to an end. That our reference point, our anchor, our identification is with a king whose kingdom is here, yes, but has not necessarily manifested itself fully. This world is not our home. Our anchor is in Jesus. It's a complete casting off. It's a desire to invest wholly and entirely in what is immediate, what is tangible. It is an allegiance. It is a declaration that says at a fundamental level, this world and all of its belongings is what I am living for. It is what I cherish most. We want to be great stewards with what we are entrusted with, but we want to be able to live free from everything that we've been entrusted with. You see, God's not afraid to bless you. 
but if the way that he blesses you ends up being what buries you. Because if you become bound to what it is that he blesses you with, we can live with whatever we can live free from. It was said of Abraham that he was a man that possessed all things, but was possessed by no thing. It's where our things literally have possessed us to the point that we couldn't imagine life being severed from certain tangible items or material situations. It's what says I identify more with a certain kind of life than a certain substance of life. Narcissism is a self-love. It won't relinquish its control. It's the boundary that says if it ever comes down to a choice of me and anybody else, it's self-preservation. Revelation 12 says they overcame him, speaking of the enemy, by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony. That's the part that we get excited about. Loving not their own lives, even to the point of death. You see, many of us, even as we sit where we're sitting, we would joyfully declare, I would give my life for Christ. And it sounds incredibly genuine. But in most cases, it would be incredibly difficult to actually believe when in certain scenarios, we want people to believe that we would be willing to die for him, but we're not even yet wholly willing to live for him. <laughs> we're not yet really ready to live for him, but yet we declare, we sing it. My life is not my own. Lord, I'll go anywhere you want me to go. Okay, I was just getting well, okay, but not there. Like, that can't be God. Lord, I'll do whatever you want me to do. Ah, yeah, well, no, I mean, not that. That can't be God, man. I bind you, devil, in the name. Ooh. And you're up all night, pacing the floor, interceding, praying in tongues, trying to bind devils when it's the will of God. You're getting counsel and calling it wisdom from people that are encouraging you to bypass the cross. See, it's, it's a self-love that has fallen more in love with the idea of preserving my own comfort and my own sense of being happy. That I'm unwilling to lay these things down. And in most cases, as difficult as this would be to believe, God is not necessarily only interested in us being happy. He wants you to have joy, but joy may make you happy, but happiness does not always necessarily become synonymous with joy. <laughs> because joy is an eternal quality, it's not a circumstantial emotion. <laughs> Jesus embodies joy. He says, I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. He says, I am the source of joy, and my voice in your life is the source of joy. And if you try to look to other things that may surround you or may swirl round about, you are eventually going to end up disappointed because these things are not equivalent to my voice and my presence and my purpose in your life, which is the fountain of real joy, the source of real joy, where I can, like Paul, learn that whether with little or with much, because I have Christ, I have it all. Because in Him is my joy. Not in whether I'm, whether I'm trying to survive and I'm sacrificing and I'm living with little, and not whether I'm living in abundance and I'm abounding on every side and I'm celebrating in victories round about. It is Jesus that matters. See, it became very real to me that in the dream, the bodybuilder had the right language, but he lacked 
the right authority. You can have the look, you can have the language, but the enemy is not intimidated by the look and the language. He's intimidated by those that God has authorized. He's intimidated by those that God has authorized. He looked into the face of the bodybuilder, right, which tells me you can build a big body, right, we're using church terms. You can build a big body and not necessarily have real authority. That many of us are looking at all of the externals and we're thinking that because someone is able to develop a big body that it must mean that they carry heaven's authority and the two do not always mean one another. They are not always mutually inclusive of one another. You can develop a big body and have all of the right look. You can have all of the right flexing power. You can seem to have it all together and not necessarily actually be making a real difference according to heaven's agenda for your lack of authority. And to this we find Jesus' words in John 14, for anybody who thought I forgot. Jesus says there's not going to be much more time for me to talk with you. John 14, 30. He says, for the ruler of this world, or the prince of the air, whatever your translation may read, he says he is soon coming. He says, I am not afraid because he doesn't have anything You see, this is where the rubber hits the road. We must understand that principalities have personalities and that the powers of the air, this term is familiar all throughout scripture. We cannot deny the existence of a kingdom versus kingdom confrontation that we are involved in. In Daniel chapter 10, it would have sounded like this when Gabriel finally made his way to Daniel. He says, the moment you started to pray, I was released into your direction. He said, but I was resisted in the heavens by the prince of Persia. He's talking about an unseen realm where there is a conflict in an unseen place, where there are high-ranking authorities and powers and principalities. There's demonic forces and dark powers that are literally trying to resist the works and the advance of God's desires, being that of the fulfillment of the manifestation of the kingdom. Daniel is praying, and God releases an angel into his direction because Hebrews says, aren't my angels but ministering spirits? Those sent to assist those that are inheriting salvation. And Daniel finds himself in the presence of an angelic being who says, when you started to pray, God heard you. You are highly favored before the Lord. Don't be afraid. And I was resisted in the heavens. He says, but because you kept praying. God released assistance and then Michael came to release me and I have now come to give you insight and understanding. In Paul's writings in Ephesians chapter 6, he says, don't wrestle with flesh and blood. Don't get caught up with names and faces and people and profiles. There's an unseen realm where there is demonic influence that is trying to get into people on the ground to animate them, to cause them to move and to act and to think certain ways. Jesus says, the ruler of the age, the prince of the air is coming, but I don't have anything to worry about because there's nothing that belongs to him that is in me. He's talking about the characteristics, the quality of life, principalities have personalities and their desire from the powers of the air is to wield influence into creation living on the ground to infect their mindset their hearts system and the way they act talk and think this is why Paul says be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind in order to displace demonic mindsets, 
We must be transformed through the power of renewing our lives in the word. Until we can displace what the demonic says, we must renew it by what God says. Principalities have personalities, and they're wielding their influence. And in many cases, because we don't even recognize the agenda of the powers of the air, we're being moved. We're being influenced. We're being moved. We're being influenced. We're being moved. We're being influenced. But Jesus says, I don't have to worry about this. My life is a confrontation to the powers of the air because the powers of the air have not gotten into me. You see, this is where John the Baptist comes into the biblical narrative. John is not just a man that was pulled out of a system. John is not just a man that is able to confront something because he was removed from it. You see, you can be removed from it and then try to confront it and not necessarily find the victory that you desire because there is a unique difference between being pulled out of something and having something pulled out of you. In many instances, we don't find authoritative scenarios for things that we secretly are entertaining. Because you will never have authority to evict what you secretly entertain. You can come up against whatever you want to come up against. And you can use all of your different systems and all of your different methods and all of the different mechanics and movements. For the disciples, it sounded like this when they got Jesus in private, realizing that they were not able to deliver the demoniac from the little boy. They got him in private. What did they say in Matthew 17? Well, why, why couldn't we do it? <laughs> you see, we'll never have authority to evict what we secretly entertain. Our hearts must be purged. Our lives must be purged. The writer says, rend your hearts and not just your garments. Listen, it's time for you to come back to me in a broken way. All of the externals, all of the facades, all of what you know to do, all of your gathering and all of your regularity and all of the little hamster wheels that you know how to jump into, they've lost the authenticity because you're doing it just for the satisfaction of the system and it's no longer an offering that is truly and wholly unto me. Jesus says the ruler of the world is coming, but he doesn't have anything in me. So I don't have to be afraid. Our lives are not just to try to confront demonic powers. If we would be conformed to the image of Jesus, we would become a confrontation. You wouldn't even have to try to do anything. When you get conformed to the image of Jesus, you become a confrontation to the powers of the air. Jesus did not come solely to try to confront the influence of the powers of the air. It was because of who he was, and it was because of what he actually was that they could not control, so they decided to crucify. So in our situation where we must think to ourselves in a moment such as this, what must I do? You see, when Peter stood on Acts 2 to declare Jesus to the crowd, it says they were so pierced to the heart that their response was, if everything you are saying about this Jesus is true, what must we do? In a scenario like this where we may feel like we are just one person or one church on the ground, our role is to find deeper places of surrender to Jesus. Our role is not to flex our muscles. Our role is not to develop some tough guy profile. Our role is not to try to get the look or the sound or the atmosphere or the facade. Our look is to find a real brokenness for the one upon whom he looks is a broken and contrite heart. For to this one he will not turn away. But for this, God must really do something 
in me. You see, we can stand with 15,000 packing stadiums if we want to, but if we stand divided, if we stand with no real unity, you see, and the issue in our nation is expressing itself in a million different ways, but at a root cause of it all, it is an attack on unity because an attack on unity is an assault on God's authority. It may sound like man versus woman. It may sound like gender and identity. It may sound like sexuality. It may sound like race and races and racism. It may sound like religious hostile ideology, but at the root of it all, it is an issue of God's unity because his unity is where we find our authority. And so though it may look like many different things, we must search our own hearts to find out if the influence of the powers of the air has somehow gotten a place or an anchor within me. And if so, I lay my life at the foot of the cross for the power of the blood and the wisdom of a broken God laying his life down to reconcile all of the hostility in the world that surrounds me. This is the only way. It's the brokenness, the path that leads to the cross. It's God actually touching my life. It's the power of the Spirit actually delivering me and not just helping me to suppress what may be going on inside of me. I don't need to know how to just hide things better. I need real deliverance that only comes by the power of the Spirit. And I need deliverance from a love of self. I need deliverance from a love of money. I need deliverance from the areas of my heart that are not finding satisfaction in Jesus. I need to come to him and lay before him and to say, Lord, unless you touch me, unless you touch me, these things will never change. Unless you touch me, I'm just going to find different ways to try to suppress it and hide it and keep it under wraps, hoping that it doesn't pop its head up at some inopportune time to ruin the imagery of what I'm projecting for everyone else around me to think what's real in me. I need God to touch me because I want to be something different and not just know how to do something different. You see, I want to be delivered from the desires, not only the penalty, not only the consequence, not only the bad feeling. I'm convicted because there's things in me that God wants to free me from because I don't understand that I'm bound until he touches me. But he touches you because he wants you to be free. And you're not really free as long as you're still bound. And there are places within us where the powers of the air have been influencing us, where we must learn how to wholly give our lives into this Jesus and the wonderful work of his spirit for him to make us something. And tonight we need God to touch our hearts. We need God to touch our hearts. This is where we begin. We begin with Jesus. And we begin with us actually becoming whole. And not just learning how to project broken pieces in a decorative manner. But because so many of us have just become okay with being broken. Because we think that it's the cultural norm. Well, you know, brother, everybody's got issues. Man, you keep that garbage to yourself if that's what you want to believe, that that's the condition in which we have to stay. The power of the blood and the wisdom of the cross promises me a different outcome. And I'm contending for real freedom and complete wholeness where I can be something new. And this is our portion. And God has to deal with every fiber of the fabric of my life. 
God has to touch deep, deep down on the inside. There's a work of digging that goes really deep and it stretches really wide. See, the bodybuilder had the activity of ministry in his life, but he didn't actually have a ministry that was on his life. There's a difference. You see, many of us are just looking to get into ministry, but we need ministry to get into us. And at any point where we've stopped short, thinking that God's done with the transformative work that he has to do in me. Good the way I am. Well, you you see, this is the way that I love Jesus. And you see, me and God, we have an understanding. And I believe that the Lord wants to touch us tonight in a very real way. Some of the things that you've been carrying for a long time are going to be broken tonight. Some of the things that you've been bothered by, some of the cycles that you've been going through, some of the revolving doors that have just been perpetual issues in your life tonight, there is real freedom by the power of the Holy Ghost, and it's freedom for you. Man, there's addictions, there's brokenness, there's bondages. Man, there's things that we don't talk about in a public sense. There's things that we're going through that, man, if only people really knew. But I can't tell anybody because it'll jeopardize my ministry. Your ministry's already been jeopardized from a heavenly perspective. You're playing a game for people. You're being puppeteered to the applause of the crowd. You don't understand, I can't talk to people because, man, they're going to think about me differently. Man, tonight we're going to bring all of our brokenness to Jesus. I'm telling you, I really sense, man, that God wants to touch people in a real way, in a powerful way. Man, that there are deeply embedded things in some of our lives, and some of us have even come into agreement that this is just who we are. It's the way things will always be. I've just learned how to be this way. I've just learned how to orient the rest of my life around being this way. I've even encouraged other people that they just have to receive me this way, that this is just who I am. Things are always going to be what they are. Man, tonight all of that comes to an end. Generational cycles... Generational curses and bondages and brokenness. Tonight, all of that comes to an end. All of the ways that the powers of the air have sought to influence us, causing us to believe that there's no real hope of freedom outside of our current experience, comes to an end. Come on, go ahead and stand up where you are. Let's just stand all over the room. And even as you stand, just just begin to turn your attention to Jesus. Come on, as you stand, just turn, just turn your attention to the Lord. I'm going to ask you, in just whatever way you may feel right now, if you're, if you're feeling right now, in whatever way that may be, just begin to respond to Him. 